welcome. My name's Dr. Jason W. Morrison, and I'm a theologist from New South Wales, Australia. Psychologists help people with themselves and other people, and theologists help people with themselves and God. I want to take you back then to the scriptural basis for that. So you've referred to Matthew 18, verse 16. And as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that in turn really is a reference back to Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. In other words, what uh, Jesus Christ was doing is referring back to that aspect of Mosaic law, dealing with uh, evidence. Uh, he did quote, as he often did, from the Mosaic Law, but he gave it Christian application. So, but that is an element to be found in the Mosaic Law as set out in Deuteronomy 19.15, is that right? It is an element that is found in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, <clears throat> what I'm interested in is, and perhaps you can help me on this, is that why that applies to a case of sexual assault when clearly... Uh, what was being addressed uh, in the reference in Matthew that, that you gave us uh, was not a question of sexual assault. Uh, yes, if I can uh, just clarify that a little further then. Uh, there are basic principles that the Bible highlights, and uh, I can give you Second Corinthians 13, verse 1. Uh, sorry, Mr. Stewart. Yes, carry on. You can hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 19, it's not just a one-off verse, but this is a basic principle for rules of evidence as found in the Bible. But if I could just emphasize again, this is only referring to a church-appointed committee that determines whether a person should remain in the congregation or not. Uh, the judicial system, and I'm sure if I can save the courts uh, or the commission's time, uh, I'm sure you're going to ref want to refer me back to Deuteronomy where it mentions the penalty of stoning. But what we need to remember is the laws that were given back in the nation of Israel. You had the judiciary, you had the punishment system, everything combined together. When the Christian arrangement came about with our Lord Jesus Christ giving us direction, uh, the Christian church does not have the authority to throw people into prison, to execute, or to do anything to them. So the judicial system in the Christian uh, arrangement involves the spiritual cleanliness of the congregation, and the rules of evidence remain the same all the way through. Well, Mr. Jackson, that's exactly the, the point I want to get to. You'll be familiar, and perhaps we can, we can go to, to Deuteronomy 22, uh, 23 to 27. Deuteronomy 22, 23 so to 27. Page 304. Mm -hmm. So where it said that if a man is found lying down with a woman who is the wife of another man, both of them must die together. Now, let me just preface this. I'm not addressing the question of the stoning. I'm addressing the question of evidence. Um, the man who lay down with the woman as well as the woman uh, sorry, I, I read that badly. Both of them must die together, the man who lay down with the woman as, as well as the woman. So you must remove what is bad out of Israel. Then it says, if a virgin is engaged to a man and another man happens to meet her in the city and lies down with her, you should bring them both out to the gate of that city and stone them to death. The girl, because she did not scream in the city, and the man, because he humiliated the wife of his fellow man. So you must remove what is evil from your midst. And then the next example is the one I'm particularly interested in. If, however, the man happened to meet the engaged girl in the field, and the man overpowered her and lay down with her, and the man who lay down with her, sorry, the man who lay down with her is to die by himself, and you must do nothing to the girl. The girl has not committed a sin deserving of death. This case is the same as when a man attacks his fellow man and murders him, for he happened to meet her in the field. And the engaged girl screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. So the point of this uh, last example is that uh, there's no second witness, is there? Because 
the woman's in the field, she screamed, but there was no one to rescue her. Do you accept that? Uh, could I explain, uh, Mr. Stewart, that, you see, I think already under testimony, uh, some of Jehovah's Witnesses have explained that the two witness, uh, witnesses uh, needed can be, in some cases, the circumstances. Uh, I think, was it a, I'll come uh, to an that. example given? I'll come to that, Mr. Jackson. Okay, so we'll get through this a lot quicker and easier if we just address it one step at a time. So, okay. the, the present step. So, the answer to your question? The present step is Sorry. this is that in that example, you accept it's a case where uh, the, uh, there was no other witness beyond the woman herself. Uh, there was no other witness except the woman herself, but added to that were the circumstances. Yes, well, the circumstances were that she was raped in the field. Mm -hmm. and, yes, but they were circumstances. And it was sufficient, there being only one witness, it was nevertheless sufficient for the conclusion that the man should be stoned to death. Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Now, is it... I think we're agreeing on the point. Yes, is it not the case that had Jesus been asked... about a case of sexual abuse, he may have referred back to this part of Deuteronomy and said that it's not required to have two witnesses. Um, I certainly would like to ask Jesus that, and I, I can't at the moment. I hope to in the future. Uh, but uh, uh, that's a hypothetical question, which we, if we had an answer, then we could support what you said. Well, it's hypothetical in a sense, but really what I'm, I'm driving at is is the scriptural basis, and, and you the scholar, I'm not, uh, is the scriptural basis to the two witness rule uh, really so solid, or is there not space for your governing body to recognize that in cases of sexual abuse uh, it need not apply? Uh, again, if I could just mention the fact that, uh, that we've already acknowledged that circumstances can also be one of the witnesses. Well, I'll, I'll come to that, but my, my, my question is a different one. It's whether the scriptural basis to, a, to the two-witness rule in relation to cases of sexual abuse has a proper foundation. Uh, we believe it does because of the number of times that that principle is emphasized in the scriptures. It's 11.50 a.m., part two of the Jehovah Witnesses, the Two Witness Fools. 7th for the 10th, 2018, and I'm Dr. Jason W. Morrison, Theologist, New South Wales, Australia. Now, one of the um, aspects of this study on the two witness rule is this use. I've got to make this clear. When Jesus was alive, before he died on the cross, before he was resurrected, the New Testament had not been cut. Jesus was still living in Old Testament times. He was still living in Old Testament times. So all in your Bible, where it's got red writing for Jesus' words and stuff, in the Gospels, that was still Old Testament. It wasn't the New Testament. Even though it's in the New Testament, while Jesus was alive for 33 years, that was still the Old Testament. It wasn't until he died on the cross that the New Testament was delivered, was cut. And this is really important because not many people realize that while Jesus was alive, he was still living in the Old Testament right up until he died on the cross. So a lot of what Jesus was saying while he was alive was related to Old Testament usages for the Israeli people. It's not all applicable to New Testament Christian living. And this is what we need to understand. A lot of people think that because Jesus is, the Gospels are in the New Testament, that when Jesus was alive, it was already the New Testament. When Jesus was born and lived up to the cross, it was still the Old Testament. And it's imperative for you to understand that. The New Testament of grace didn't begin until Jesus died on the cross. 
So a lot of what Jesus was saying was applicable to the Jewish people under the Old Testament. You've got to understand that. Because in Matthew 18, Jesus was speaking to Old Testament people, people that were in the Old Testament, trying to break them free and move them out of Old Testament t teaching in preparing them for the salvation that would come through him because he was the Savior. Now let's move on from that. I'm going to take you now to the Treasury of Scripture Knowledge, a very powerful, very powerful Bible study tool. Recommend it to anybody. Now what this does, and I'll just come back, is parallel verses thematically with all the other verses that are related meaningfully to the context of the verse. Right? Now what I'm going to show you now is that we are not under the law. We were never under the law as Gentiles in the first place. The law was given to the Jews. It was never given to the Gentiles. And we've intruded into something that never had anything to do with us. I don't think a lot of people realize this. As I've said before, you go up to someone in the street and say, how are you getting on with God? And they'll go, well, I keep the commandments. It's irrelevant. Keeping the commandments is irrelevant. What a lot of people don't realize is the law is a cursed thing. It's a good and holy thing. But for us humans who have a sinful nature, it's a cursed thing. Now you say to me, how can you say that? How can you say that as a theologist? How can you say the law is a cursed thing? Well, Christ has delivered, let's just see what we get. Christ has delivered nothing. Let's go with this one then. Curse of the... Now, Galatians is the big one for this. Galatians. The law brings a curse. Now, I don't know if you realize this. Now, I'm going to ask you a very serious question. How many of you viewers right now know that trying to live by anything under the Old Testament law is a curse? It's going to curse you. Now, it's easy. what is that curse? Well, the curse is that it, when we think, when we think there's something we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, we are empowering our evil nature. And unfortunately, 99% of religious people are doing this <clears throat> and they're not aware of it. And it's very, very dangerous. And this is where all the trouble in the religious people is coming from. Now, Galatians 3 has a lot to do with this and we'll go there because I do my studies on the run. I don't prepare these. Oh, foolish religious people, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Now, what is the truth? The truth is there's nothing you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad because Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins, for our righteousness. He gave us his righteousness for time and eternity. There's nothing we need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, which is the law. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. So that's the truth. That's the only significant and central truth to the New Testament. That Jesus Christ was crucified for our sins, was buried and raised again for our eternal life. All of us, not just an anointed class, everyone. Excuse me. Sorry, viewers, I've got phones ringing and things going on. Please excuse me. Now, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. That's the finished work of Christ, which is the central point of our salvation. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Now, this is what I want to ask you. 
Did you receive whatever you think you have in your Christianity by the things that you do or don't do to make God happy or stop him from being sad or by faith? Because it's by faith and anything else will lead to a curse. The curse. Are you so foolish? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Now what you've got to connect here is the two dots, which is the law, works of the law, and the flesh. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore he who supplies the spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, which is anything you think you need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, or by the hearing of faith. Now faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, doesn't it? Just as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted him for righteousness, regardless of his behaviour, because he was a bit of a wretched man, Abraham, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Now the Gentiles, right, now he's, he's made it clear and distinct to drawn a line between the Israelis and the Gentiles. Now the Gentiles were never ever under the law. The law was given to the Jews. It wasn't given to the Egyptians. It wasn't given to the Philistines. It was given to the Jews. And the Gentiles are justified by faith. So preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In all the nations shall be blessed. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. So the law, he's drawn a clear line. The law was given to the Jews. Not the Philistines, not the Girgashites, not all this. And the Gentiles are to be justified by faith. And that faith is believing that Jesus Christ was crucified. And his finished work is our provision. Now we're going to move into the part where it teaches us that the law brings a curse. For as many as are of the works of the law. Now what are the works of the law? Simply, the simplest explanation of this is anything you think you need to do to make God happy or stop him from being sad is a work of the law. Anything, anything. And as many as are of the works of the law are what? They're under a curse. They're under a curse. Now what is that curse? Well, I can tell you that in several places. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. It did, that's 1 Corinthians 15. Look, why is the law a curse? Because, where is it? Because this, here. The sting of death is, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength or the power of sin is the law. Where does sin get its strength? Now, I'm, I'm asking you, this isn't a joke. Where does sin get its strength? Where does our sin get its strength? From anything we think we need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. And how do you fix that? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through who? Through the Lord Jesus Christ. Gosh, why do people make themselves... What's another one? He, oh, he's just making this up. Oh, well, what about Romans 6.14? Romans 6... Let's just go to Romans 6 and 14. Romans 6.14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Now we're talking about sin having dominion over us. Now man was given dominion over the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, the beasts of the field, and all this. He had dominion over them. Now, how does sin get dominion over us? For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under law. So when you're under law, when you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're giving sin dominion over you. And that's why a lot of religious people are dysfunctional. 
and harmful. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I really don't know. People from all over the world say to me, why do you keep raving on about trying to make God happy and stopping him being sad by things that you do? Because I don't want sin to have dominion over people. For s You're under grace. That means thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. You're, bit, you're alive to God in Christ Jesus. You're to reckon yourselves dead to sin. How do you reckon yourselves dead to sin? By knowing that there's nothing you can do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Well, that's up to you, isn't it? But you've got less chance of religiously sinning if you're not under law. All right. Now, let's turn to the treasury of Scripture knowledge. Now what this does, it thematically connects all verses related to the scripture that you're using as the main context. Romans 7, 6. But we, but now we are delivered from the law. Now he's speaking to Jews in Romans 7, not to Gentiles, to Jews. But now we have been delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. Now, what are some relevant verses? Here they are here. Look. Wherefore, my brethren, you are also become dead to the law. Now, this isn't even applicable to Gentiles because they're not under the law. But, but these religious organizations have connected themselves to a set of rules and standards that are none of their business. It's absolutely none of your business to be meddling with this stuff. By the body of Christ, that you should be married to one another. Now, what Paul was trying to do was help the Jews transition away from the law and into Christ, which they thought was an abomination. But he was managing to do it, and I don't know how successful he was, but he was pretty successful. Um, Romans 6, 14 through 15, we've already read that, but sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under law. There's nothing you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? God forbid. You've got less chance of religiously sinning under grace and no chance of not religiously sinning under law. You will sin. Galatians 3.13 Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. Galatians 23 through 25. But before faith came, in his speaking to Jews, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. See, <clears throat> by the time Christ came, you think they would have been saying, we don't want anything to do with this wretched law. It's just bringing us undone, that we might be justified by faith. But after faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster, which is the law. So why are these religious organizations teaching laws for righteousness? They're cursing their followers. <clears throat> but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that's the Jews, that we, the Gentiles, might receive the adoption as of sons. So there's Jews and Gentiles. The law was never given to the Gentiles. Romans 7, 1. Now ye not brethren, for I speak to them that know the law. He was speaking to the Jews, the Jewish believers in Romans 7. How that the law have dominion over a man as long as he liveth only if you put yourself under it. Now, if we go back to Galatians 3, where is Galatians 3? Is it gone? Oh, I had Galatians 3, but we went to Romans 6. Let's go back to Galatians 3 for a minute. Just bear with me, you people that trifle with the Bible. Oh, it's a dangerous book. Oh, it's a dangerous book. Um, 
Brethren, I speak in the manner of men, though it is only a man's covenant. This is Roman, uh, Galatians 3.15. Yet it is confirmed. No one annuls or adds to it. Now to Abraham and his seed, that's the Christ, were the promises made. He does not say, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one seed, and to your seed, who is the Christ. Right? And this I say, that the law, which was 430 years later, cannot annul the covenant that was confirmed before God in Christ, that it should make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance is of the law, it is no longer a promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. See, the law had nothing to do with salvation. As Galatians said, all the law was was a tutor to bring creep people to Christ by wearing them out. But the law is something that feeds our sinful nature and our sinful nature doesn't want us to come to Christ or stay in Christ. This is such a vital subject and such a neglected subject that I'm staggered at how many people don't realize how dangerous the law is. Now something, I think it's the Holy Spirit, I don't want to get too spiritual, but something's telling me to go to Romans 4 right now. Romans 4. Now, will you work with me through Romans 4? We've got to get to the bottom of the fact that you've been delivered from the law. You've got nothing to do with the law. And these people that are teaching you law, they need to be locked up. What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about. But he wasn't justified by works, was he? But he's got nothing to something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but as debt. And that's part of the curse. See, when you think there's something you need to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad, you're just making a debt for yourself. There's all these people running around thinking they're pleasing Jehovah. And they're just causing a debt for themselves. They're, they're, they're spoiling their minds. They're making themselves dysfunctional. They're in all sorts of sin. Oh, gosh. Um, now, but to him who does not work, but believes on the finished work of Christ, on Christ who justifies the ungodly, not these ones that think they've got to be godly to get saved. He justifies the ungodly by faith. His faith is accounted to him for righteousness. See, it's safer to live by faith and allow the Holy Spirit to get rid of your sinfulness and try and get rid of your sinfulness yourself because you're only going to make yourself more sinful. I bet you've never heard that before. Gosh. He justifies the ungodly so that his spirit can help them transform. Let's type in transform. Transform. What we got? We got three three verses. Oh, the the Jehovah Witnesses love Romans twelve one and two. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now you can't renew your mind. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. But we all, Second Corinthians three eighteen, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. It's the Holy Spirit, by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who transforms us. There's transforming in the negative sense. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11.13 For such are false teachers, apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Now, these are the people that were telling the people that there was something they needed to do or not do to make God happy or stop him from being sad. 2 Corinthians 11.15 There it is. No, Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. So there's obviously a lot uh, to talk about this in 2 Corinthians 11. Because Satan can transform himself into an angel of light. There's a lot of ministers running around out there, honestly. Oh, gosh. 
They're telling people to tithe and all this other stuff. They're taking their money. They think they're doing it for Jehovah and he's, and he's, he's working that. Honestly, in some cases that's true, but in most cases it's not. We're going to be transformed at the resurrection as well, which is what that is applicable to in Philippians 3.21. Now I want to turn to Colossians, and I'm sure it's chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, it's not going to give me it there. Let's try that. <clears throat> um, the preeminence of Christ. Um, or is it Colossians 3? What one was it? I don't know. But we'll find it, won't we? Um, Colossians 3. Where? I think it's Colossians 1. Bear with me. I don't want to read it all. We, time's getting away on us now. Um, it's Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1. Let's go to Ephesians 1. Now, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Your sins are forgiven. They're already forgiven. Past, present and future. That doesn't mean they're not consequential. They're just forgiven. According to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the ministry of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, we might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. You have that inheritance now, if you, you believers, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Now, I'm looking for the part where he abolished, he abolished in his body, the law. Okay. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, which is the finished work of Christ. In him also, having believed, you were sealed. Now you've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. I promise. And who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the pur purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Can you say, I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit and I'm guaranteed an inheritance? I have been sealed. You say, it. I have been sealed with the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of my inheritance, which is eternal life. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that God, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. See, the wisdom and the revelation has to be in the knowledge of him, not in all this watchtower and rubbish. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory in his inheritance in the saints, which is the exceeding great of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places far above principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named not only in this age but also in that which is to come now where is this abolished come on Abol abolished Come on, where is it? I thought it was in Ephesians 1. Ephesians 2. Do excuse me. We're still learning. Ephesians 2. We're still learning from what we're reading, I'm meaning. Now, where is it? Okay. Um, here. Christ, our peace. Ephesians 2.14. For he himself is our peace. Now, you get that scripture where they say, where Jesus says, I didn't come to bring peace on the earth. At that point, no, he didn't, because he had to go to the cross. And that wasn't a very peaceful thing, was it? But through the cross, he brought our peace. 
But see how you can mix up what he was saying then with what's actually happening now. Don't do that. Who has made both one. That's the Jews and the Gentiles. And has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. What enmity? That is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. See, the enmity. Now, what's enmity mean? Well, let's find out. Let's find out. Well, there's the surf camp for those that like kiteboarding. But what's the enmity? Let's find enmity. Let's find the meaning of enmity here. Hostility, animosity, antagonism, friction, empathy, anim animus, opposition, dissension, rivalry, feud. Con it's not a very good thing, is it? And that's what it is. And he's broken down that. Now, my point is to the Jehovah Witnesses, the two witness fools, you're not under the law. So why try and apply law to something that doesn't exist? I'm going to type in here in Google, right, how to deal with religious, I've never done this before, criminals. Let's just see. Um, <clears throat> Um, there's a lot of stuff here. Okay, let's have a look. We'll look at this. What have we got to lose? Honestly, can't get any worse. How to deal with criminals. Is, is there a biblical principle behind the punishment of those who break the law? Now, this is secular law. Um, many evangelical Christians believe that when it comes to wrongdoers or criminals, the state's first task is to make them suffer for the wrong they have done, whether the lash or exile from one's homeland, or a stretch on the rack, or exposure to public shame, or confinement in jail, or even the noose. Punishment is expected. Is there a Christian principle from which retributive justice is derived? Retributive justice did not arise from any Christian principle. Almost every pre-Christian society dealt with wrongdoers by causing them pain. Even so, retributive justice is supported by a biblical example. In ancient Israel, God's commandments, which were not under, were the law of the land. In ancient Israel, therefore, all wrongdoing violating God's law was a criminal offence for which wrongdoers paid a penalty, often a shocking steep one such as stoning. Don't know what this is, but we'll get rid of it. Though it brings the good news of grace to sinners, the New Testament does not disavow the Old Testament way of punishing wrongdoers. The Apostle Paul insists in Romans 13 that God invested the state with a sword. And what is a sword for but to kill or to cause pain? Jesus said that we should render to the state what properly belongs to the state. That includes pedophiles. And though he has taxes in mind, we might reasonably infer that giving the state the job of punishing wrongdoers is one way of giving the state its due. Amen to that. Jesus implied, did he not, that God gave Pilate the authority to execute wrongdoers. And when, as in Jesus' own case, he had an innocent person on his hands, it seems then that the New Testament grants the state the right to punish wrongdoers. Even the cross of Christ seems to support retributive justice. That is a certainty. So, what about this Jehovah Witness 2 witness rule? I'm surprised that the governments are still letting this happen. We are delivered from the law. We're not under the law. The law brings a curse. It goes on and on and on. Christ abolished the law. The law is finished. The law brings debt. And on and on and on and on. And yet they want to apply a two-witness rule to modern, to modern society. Um, it's wrong. It's not biblical. It's not in the Bible. And it's just a classic example of how deliberately ignorant these Jehovah Witnesses want to be. Now I'm going to apply now a clip from the Australian Royal Commission. And we'll go from there. Right, going on now to address the two witness rule. Um, Mr. O'Brien, you're aware, of course, that the Royal Commission found that the application of the two witness rule in cases involving child, child sexual abuse is wrong. You're aware of that finding? Yes, 
were of the finding and the recommendation that the Jehovah's Witness organization should revise and modify its application of the two witness rule, at least in cases involving complaints of child sexual abuse. You're aware of that recommendation? Yes, I'm aware. And I take it that that finding and that recommendation were the subject of the discussions you referred to earlier in the organization with regard to its response to the Royal Commission? Yes. So we considered uh, the implications of that finding. And um, your response is to say that the two witness rule is required by the scriptures and can't be changed or avoided, is that correct? That's correct, that's our stand. And, uh, Your Honor, I'm not sure what Your Honor's intention is. How much longer would you think? Uh, well, I'll take us till one o'clock, Your Honor. Um, well, we better take the morning adjournment then. We'll take that adjournment now. Please be seated. Mr. Ryan will indeed thinks if, if you wish to answer. I'm just dealing with the um, two witness rule you'll recall, and I'd like to take you to um, your response document, Mr. O'Brien, at tab 1, page 14, paragraph 7.4. And where you, uh, you set out, you say, uh, moreover, it should be noted that sufficient scriptural evidence to establish a serious sin may consist of two or more witnesses to the same sin, or two or more witnesses to the same type of sin committed on different occasions. So the rule, leaving in the absence of a confession, um, requires corroboration um, of an allegation. Is that right? That's correct, scripturally. Um, yes, and a particular type of corroboration, um, being another witness, um, or as it's put here, another witness um, to a different occasion of a similar type of sin. Is that right? That's how I understand. Yes. And then you go on and you say, on this basis, the scriptural rule of evidence as applied by Jehovah's Witnesses or is already in harmony with the model bill, evidence tendency and coincidence model provisions by admitting tendency or coincidence evidence when establishing sin in their eternal ecclesiastical proceedings. Now, leaving aside um, the admission of evidence, let's just deal with this question of corroboration. You're aware, I take it, that the criminal courts do not require corroboration uh, of child sexual abuse or indeed the most heinous of sins. Mm. Yes, I'm, I'm not um, clear on that particular well, point. I'll ask you to accept but I'll that. I'll take your word for it. Section sure 164 right. of the Evidence Act um, abolished the corroboration rule. Um, so it's just misleading to say that this scriptural rule of two witness rule is in harmony with um, the law of evidence. It's, it's not in any way, is it? I would defer to your um, knowledge of the law on that. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Jackson of the governing body gave evidence uh, in case study 29 suggesting that there may be a role for circumstantial or corroborating evidence such as the evident trauma suffered by a victim in determining the truth of an allegation. For those who are following, that's a transcript 15973, starting at line 37. Now, subsequent to um, case study 29, the rule has not been modified so as to allow circumstantial or corroborating evidence such as evident trauma suffered by a victim. Um, was that nevertheless considered? I'm sure Mr Jackson would have taken that back to um, for consideration in the United States, but I'm not aware of discussions on the particular point. So we, we too um, deduce, I take it, that he was wrong in saying that there that there may be a role for such evidence, that it turned out there isn't a role for such evidence. Is that right? I couldn't answer that on behalf of Mr Jackson, sorry. Now, if you go to the service desk guidelines at tab 6, uh, paragraph 8, Uh, 
um, you'll see there it says there, for an accusation of serious wrongdoing to be established from a scriptural standpoint, there must be sufficient scriptural evidence, either a confession or testimony from two credible witnesses. Now, you'll accept, of course, that what's not included in the statement of the rule there is the additional component to it, which you speak to, which is admissibility um, of another witness to a separate incident um, of the same type of wrongdoing. So but that would be understood. That's uh, our policy on two witnesses. So one has a statement here to guide the service desk, um, but it doesn't um, state uh, the second component to the rule. If I could, Mr. Um, yes, Mr. Sphinx. The, without looking it up there, but uh, paragraph 8 um, references KS10, which is the uh, Elder Shepherding Manual, and those um, paragraphs referred to there specifically state those points, so uh, confession. Well, yes, uh, I'm aware of that, but so it's there, but one has to go to another document to find it. Is that your point? I, I think if I could, by way of example, again, it's about audience, um, Mr Stewart, the, the service desks know that case 10 well, uh, so we understand that somebody else looking in would say that's the case, but if I could, by way of example, I've done my best to read almost every um, issue paper and report from the Royal Commission and hundreds of hours of waiting through and there's invariably a, a you know executive summary now I'm not using this as a direct parallel but this is simply an outline an overview the extracts of all those publications are, are not put in there but that reference could could I refer to it in the KS10 yes well I've, I've got it yeah it's at um, tab 9 uh, Ringtail 75 at the foot of the page, it states what we've just spoken about. If there are two or three witnesses to the same kind of wrongdoing, but each one is witness to a separate incident, the elders can consider their testimony. That's what you're referring to? Correct. Yes. Well, <clears throat> where you refer to this in your joint statement, let me take you to that, tab 2, paragraph 26. Um, the second sentence, uh, however, in the absence of a confession of more than one witness, a single incident, the scriptural rule of evidence establishes and allows the admissibility of another witness to a separate instance of the same wrongdoing. And you see you have footnote 15 there, and it references um, three different documents. Do you see that? Yes. And the third of those documents, which is the one which has ringtail WAT 0010040068, at paragraph 11, um, uh, I, I beg your pardon, the, the, the middle of those documents is the KS10, the Shepherd book. Correct. Correct. At, at the paragraph we were looking at a minute ago, paragraph Correct. 37. Yes. But the first of those documents is a 1991 document, pay attention to yourselves and all the flock. Is that right? Uh, but I have no reason to doubt that. I'm, I haven't got that. And the 1991 document is of the nature of a document that goes to all the congregations, uh, all the congregants, is that right? I'd need to see the document. I've no reason to well, question what you're saying. I'm not familiar with the document. It's the 1991, pay attention to yourselves and all the flock. I am familiar with that publication. So yeah. Is that for elders or for congregants? Uh, for elders. For elders, right. And uh, the current elders document is the shepherd document. 2010, not so. Correct. So the 1991 document you reference is an out-of-date document. That was superseded. The, mm -hmm. the uh, Shepherd uh, manual superseded. That was a previous version. Yes. So in January, uh, I beg your pardon, February the 24th, when you sign the statement, you give a, a, an old superseded reference. Uh, followed by the current reference, and I believe the purpose at the time was to show a, a, a consistent um, process there. I think mean, if you put the two together, you'll find a similar, but I don't have it in front of me. And the third reference you give 
is the 1 October 2012 letter, which was replaced by the 1 August 2016 letter. Correct. And the August 2016 letter doesn't state the, the, this rule in this fashion. You see, Mr. Spinks, we're back to where we were in case study 29 of really struggling with just what the position is because there's so many different conflicting documents and we're given documents which have been superseded as authority for what's said to be current policy. Well, Mr. Stewart, that's just incorrect. Well, please Let me take you back to paragraph 8 again, if I could. Paragraph 8 of what? Of the um, guidelines for service desks. Yes. That's tab 6. Uh, guidelines, the uh, current reference, uh, uh, KS 10, Chapter 5, is the shepherding textbook. I, I take your point that when you're reading a statement, we've provided historical background, but I recall in the preparation of that, that was to overcome what we thought would be an obvious objection, that that's not always been the case. But the latest reference is in the footnote there, and it, it certainly is in the uh, paragraph 8 of the... Uh, service desk guidelines. Now, if the suggestion is that every one of those um, extracts should be pasted into the, uh, the document, I'd, we'd be happy to consider that. But uh, again, we're extremely familiar with that source material and it's, it's there in the current letter. Well, the suggestion is, is that you, you, you reference uh, out of date and superseded policies and support um, of your statement as to what the current policy is. Mr Stewart, again with respect, I've just very clearly explained that the reason for that, the current policy is there and to uh, address what we felt would have been an obvious objection uh, from the Commission that that hadn't previously been our, our policy. So that's simply a footnote reference to show the existence of the, the policy. Just help me to understand the role of women. Yeah, Dr. Jason Morrison, theologist again. I just want to say thank you for watching the videos and I uh, hope you got plenty of uh, self rediscovery and freedom out of it. If you watched it on YouTube, please share or like, um, maybe even comment. If you watched it on Facebook, like, comment, share. Um, but most of all, get out and live. This isn't a rehearsal. You've got a one of life. Don't let your loyalty and your faithfulness blind you to the life that you should be experiencing. Till the next video, thank you for watching and bye for now.